So, hello, and thank you for joining this webinar, which is the latest of our series of online training courses that we've produced here from the IEA, where we focused on some of the um, key aspects of energy efficiency policy. Uh, these training courses have their have their provenance in our face-to-face -face training, where we've worked with more than two and a half thousand people from around the world to uh, work on a common language for energy efficiency policy so that we can all share experiences and, and help be more effective by working together. Um, these um, We can't reach everybody, of course, with the face-to-face -face training. So where we're, we're talking about very important topics, which are common to all, that touch everybody's lives, we, we produce one of these online training courses. Um, so, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Of course, um, appliance policy is one of the most effective uh, parts of our energy efficiency policy toolkit. And um, where we've seen programs that have existed for the, the last 20 or 30 years, um, countries and jurisdictions are saving more than 15% of their electricity consumption compared with had they not had these programs. But they have complexities. They have various elements that need to come together and they have to be um, worked on over years. They have to be updated. So one of the things we want to introduce you today is that process of uh, um, what, what some of the, the major successful programs have looked like uh, and why they've succeeded. So we have, um, as well as presentations from the IEA, we have presentations from Appliance Energy Efficiency Policy Champions um, from the European Union, from China, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and also from CLASP, who will be featuring their experience around the world and with a bit of a spotlight on India. So I will stop there for the time being and hand over to Clara. Thank you, Mel, um, and uh, welcome all to this uh, launch of the Appliance Energy Efficiency Policy webinar. Um, as Mel mentioned, today we're here to, to present the Appliance Energy Efficiency Policy online training uh, we've uh, developed. Next slide, please. This um, training is the last of the IEA's uh, online training. Uh, we have a number of them, um, one on fundamentals of statistics, essentials of policy making, buildings and smart cities, and the appliance energy efficiency policy one is our last um, development, and it is the consolidation of uh, content, insights, case studies, and understandings that have been um, combined for, or com compiled for um, decades in our uh, understanding. So we're very happy to, to be able to share all of that um, in a kind of online, interactive, self-paced uh, way. Here you have the link um, to the webinar, but I'll be sharing the, the link to the to uh, enroll in the in the webinar in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. The course aims to prepare participants uh, to advance in energy efficiency policies for appliances and equipment. It does this by explaining um, how policies can reduce energy use, but also by introducing the principles of how to design and implement energy efficiency in uh, what we have point as the, at the IEA as the Energy Efficiency Policy Package, which is a package that integrates regulation, information, and incentives to drive um, energy efficiency towards higher uh, levels in the most effective way. The primary target uh, of, the, um, of the, this training is policymakers, along with other stakeholders involved in the design and implementation of a past energy efficiency uh, policy, and of course, also open to any uh, other concerned uh, stakeholder or citizen that is interested in the, in the topic. The course consists on seven modules. The first module is on the introduction of appliance energy efficiency policy, followed by the regulation, a deep dive into regulation, <clears throat> be it minimum energy performance standards, followed by information um, through a deep dive into the energy labels, incentives and industry transformation, and also an overview in module five on data needs and uh, data collection methods to really understand uh, the market and make sure that uh, all the progress that's being done in the policy um, landscape is being properly monitored and, and uh, improved uh, with time, uh, as well as an introduction to compliance in module uh, six, 
uh, followed by introduction to evaluation. Now, all these modules are then wrapped up by a final assi uh, assignment, as well as in each of the modules, there is a mandatory evaluation. Um, we like to call it activity, where the participants must perform uh, the, the, this evaluation to, to complete the module. Upon, upon the um, uh, completion of uh, these uh, evaluations, the, the, the participant will have a certificate of completion of the, of the modules. Now, here's the link in this slide, uh, and we will share that in the chat as well, uh, to sign up uh, to the online course. And uh, we really encourage you to, to do so as it's something, as I mentioned, it is self-paced, um, it is interactive, it is full of exercises, and it's uh, fun, uh, basically, while, while really having a deep dive uh, understanding of our plans and efficiency policies, design and implementation tactics. Now, we, we, before we move on to the to the presentations and the panel discussion, we wanted to bring to to your um, uh, attention the performance um, framework, which was developed by the Seed Initiative, um, and it serves as a visual representation uh, of ongoing efforts to enhance energy efficiency in um, specific products, as it can be visualized. Within the latter, each rung outlines the policy performance criteria, including MEPS, as well as um, label thresholds, for instance, could be also included for both categorical and endorsement label. These uh, performance ladder also outline the potential future aspirational targets, as you can see in the upcoming example. And the ultimate objective um, also of this ladder is, uh, could be to, to visualize a harmonization of uh, various policy tools, ensuring uh, coordinated efforts and allowing for a periodic revisions of um, the, um, the efficiency levels as needed as well. Um, now, moving on to a specific example, an illustration of the latter approaches provided uh, in this slide, uh, where we showcase how countries in the Latin America region can work towards meeting the goals to the product efficiency call to action, which seeks, uh, which seeks to um, double the efficiency by 2030 of uh, selected products, in this case, industrial motors. And as you can see in this figure, um, it is proposed that by 2030, all countries, including Chile, achieve I4, uh, which is the super premium efficiency uh, level for motors, emphasizing the replacement at all levels, uh, which is crucial also to avoid uh, the use of secondhand inefficient motors. While performance required requirements can initially um, be set at the single level, as you can see in the 2025 suggested level, um, adopting a phased approach that can visualize uh, in this performance ladder for MEPS um, with increased levels over time of energy efficiency can really deliver a greater efficiency performance. This multi-level strategy also offers um, manufacturers a clear planning uh, and horizon um, which uh, allows them to plan ahead and really uh, be in line with the overall ambitions and plans of the, of the government. It also allows and facilitates regional harmonization uh, while aligning with international standards, such as those uh, used or already um, stipulated in China and the, United Nations, and the United States. Next slide, please. Now I'll, I'll move on, we can move on now to the presentations on appliance energy efficiency policy from uh, country champions. And we'll uh, start, kickstart um, with Niels sharing the European Union perspective. Thank you, Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clara and, and Mel, and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to represent the EU perspective here. Um, as, as was said already, Appliance policies are, of course, a kind of a policy that work uh, over the long term. Um, and so let's say uh, what I represent here, uh, will present here is, of course, the, the result of decades of, of, uh, of work in the, in the EU. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have effectively more than three decades of experience with appliance policies in the EU. Um, 
as early as in the 70s, there were a first attempt following the uh, energy, the oil crisis in, in the 70s. There was a first attempt to adopt uh, energy labels for appliances. Uh, it was uh, voluntary for the member states of the European Union, so it wasn't uh, greatly taken up. But then uh, when, when the idea of a single market for the European Union came about in the, and was realized in the early 90s, uh, then we had the first mandatory energy labels, uh, the first one being for uh, refrigerators, household refrigerators. And there we basically have the third generation of labels now. And um, together with the maps as well, uh, uh, what we call in Europe eco-design requirements, but effectively minimum energy performance requirements and requirements on, on other types of performances uh, like, like noise. Um, and... It's been tremendous, the, the reduction in average uh, consumption um, of the stock of refrigerators in, in Europe. And we have, uh, meanwhile, expanded the program of maps and labels to uh, 30 product groups, uh, roughly, um, covering almost half of all electricity going through, uh, all, or half of all electricity consumed in the EU is, is going through appliances that are regulated one or the other way. Um, next slide, please. So uh, why uh, have we been doing this? Well, it's really because there are multiple benefits of this. And we, um, we regularly publish so-called eco-design impact accounting reports that take stock and try to quantify the accumulated benefits of this. And the latest version has just been published. And it's estimated that in the European Union, consumer expenditure in 22 was reduced by some 89 billion euros. Uh, and, and that annual saving is set to increase to around 150 billion euros by, by 2030 as the stock uh, of appliances is, is changes and, and the benefits of the, of the better appliances um, uh, come to fruition. Just a few examples. Uh, well, perhaps on the right side, you can see the circle there, which is an illustration of where the savings occur. Um, there's a lot in heating and cooling also quite a lot in lighting, um, electronics, uh, food, um, refrigeration and cooking appliances, but also industrial um, uh, components. Uh, so all the benefits are not occurring in, in, the, in the residential sector, also quite substantial in the commercial and industrial sectors. Um, just a few examples, uh, new rules that will apply as of mid next year uh, on phones and, and tablets. Will are estimated to uh, to save consumers uh, around 20 billion euros a year by 2030 uh, because of lower acquisition costs. Because we have also set durability requirements, repairability requirements, leading to longer lifetime for uh, smartphones. Um, horizontal rules on off uh, and sti standby mode of electricity consumption were introduced in 2008, and um, they have been uh, strengthened uh, a number of times and the latest in 23 with effect of next year. And they, they are estimated to lead to 36 terawatt hours of savings by 2030 or around 8 billion euros of sa annual savings by then. As I mentioned, I already mentioned refrigerators, it's roughly 16 billion euros per year by 2030. And... Um, electric motors and variable speed drives, importantly, to uh, allow the motors to operate with, uh, uh, let's say, in, in function of demand and needs. Um, they are uh, likewise estimated to save around 11 billion euros per, per year. In 20. And this is uh, consumer expenditure, but there are many other co-benefits. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is, let's say, of course, the main takeaway. Uh, this is good for consumers, but it's also good for uh, the climate, the environment, health. We, we set requirements also on air pollutant emissions for when it's relevant, noise emissions, um, and so on. Uh, the savings, of course, help reduce uh, the needs for investments in the energy system. And it drives manufacturers to uh, innovate and uh, improve their appliances over time and invest in that, and therefore also gain a competitive advantage. Um, an important lesson from Europe is, I think, that uh, it's important to involve industry, uh, manufacturers, importers, retailers, but also NGOs and independent experts when we design these policies and calibrate the, the ambition level. 
it's as was also mentioned it's important to realize that this is a kind of long haul policy that doesn't have necessarily high immediate effects it needs to be sustained effort and that requires sustained resources as well to develop the policies to update or maintain them uh, of course for uh, to test uh, to the test capacity in laboratories understanding consumer behavior and so on and market market surveillance and compliance but uh, of course the good news is that uh, there's such a lot of diff uh, let's say experience in this field and that's of course why also the course is there there's no need to start from scratch learning from others and reusing what's suitable in a specific national context is is uh, very reasonable uh, to do even in the European Union, we don't do everything ourselves. We learn from colleagues abroad, uh, including the US or elsewhere. Um, and uh, and I would say a second message is to be pragmatic. Depending on your situation and so on, start, take one step by step, and then you can expand scope and, and ambition levels and so on. And finally, I would say this, I think this is a key importance, uh, not least for the European Union, try to address also another other important aspects of the life cycle because for some products much of the energy is actually used in in upstream and not in during operation for, for instance computers and tablets a lot of energy goes into production and so things like durability repairability spare part requirements are very important and so just to highlight that we launched a portal uh, the link is there a portal to uh, the brand new it was launched last week uh, or second april you, where you can find extensive information on our policies. And um, uh, above that is the, um, uh, the April database, which uh, where all energy labeled products in uh, Europe have to be registered and which uh, gives a ph phenomenal transparency on the efficiency levels achievable uh, and on the market in Europe. And that's of course also something that's open to the whole world and you, you can uh, use as much as you want. It's available with the APIs and so on. and and it's already used extensively for uh, online retailing uh, and uh, by platforms like Google and Amazon to show the labels. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Niels, uh, for this um, European Union perspective. With this framing, uh, we will move on to, to um, hear from Ju Wan Chia the Vice Director and Associate Professor on Energy Labeling Center from the China National Institute of Standardization Studies um, to share the, the China perspective. Thank you, Jim, Jim, the floor is yours. Oh, okay, thank you, Clara, and thanks, Mel. Uh, I'm Yu Zhuan Xia from China National Institute of Standardization. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to share some perspectives based on China's practices. Um, so, in my opinion, uh, applies energy efficiency policy package uh, can bring multiple benefits by impacting on market manufacturers and the consumers and help policymakers to achieve national energy and the climate goals. So, firstly, uh, for the market, energy efficiency standards and the labeling programs can raise awareness of purchasing efficient uh, appliances. Uh, accelerate the uptake of highly efficient equipment. According to a study by a sector association, uh, the average awareness level of allergy level in 2015 to 2017 uh, has reached the uh, 89%. Uh, for the urban residents, uh, the percentage is uh, 96. So it's higher than other similar green neighbors. Uh, if we take the AC market, for example, due to the new ambitious, uh, sorry, uh, please go back. <laughs> yeah, if we take the AC market, for example, due to the new ambitious energy efficiency standard and the labeling program, uh, we should raise a uh, various speed AC and uh, fix the speed AC together. The market share of variable speed AC which is, has more higher uh, energy efficiency grades, uh, increases from 60% in 2018 to 93% in 2021. Uh, and also for the manufacturers and the consumers, the more and more stringent energy efficiency standards 
drive the manufacturers to speed up the uh, research and the development of energy saving technologies and uh, scale up its application. Uh, that's to provide consumers with affordable, efficient appliances and help them to save electricity costs. Uh, the, for example, um, uh, the AE standards of refrigerator in China has been revised for by four times, uh, and the uh, uh, daily consumption of the refrigerator has uh, has dropped uh, to a larger extent. And also in the EU, uh, the same picture with Neil maybe. The earlier electricity consumption of a refrigerator freezer has dropped to 180 kilowatt hours. Uh, and also for the government, the energy efficient policy package mobilized product efficiency to achieve carbon reduction targets. Uh, also take the AC, for example, from 2008 to 2023. Uh, the average efficiency in APF keeps increasing from 3.86 to 4.89, uh, improved by nearly 30 percent. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, under the uh, energy efficiency standards and labeling, and also some incentive pro program, and also some maybe government pro procurement. Um, they have uh, comprehensive comprehensive uh, impact on the market. Uh, the maps helps to phase out the low efficiency products and also uh, the grid two and the grid one helps to promote high efficiency products and also they provide the technical uh, uh, reference uh, for incent for incentive program for the government procurement and also for some income tax incentives uh, for manufacturers and and uh, by Doing so, uh, the overall uh, level of the market has been increased to a large extent. So for the lowest uh, progress in China, uh, during the uh, 14th five-year plan period, uh, 10 uh, standards have been released, including the electric, electric fans, uh, fluorescent lamps, and also displays, commercial uh, electromagnetic stoves, and also heat pumps and so on. Uh, and also, they are also developing uh, 17 mandatory energy efficiency standards for refrigerators and for mi uh, microcomputers and so on. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Chia, so much for this uh, overview of the China uh, energy efficiency policy. Um, framework for appliances and equipment. Now we move on to the Sub-Saharan Africa perspective uh, through our speaker today, Bradley Makaliki, who, who is a technical uh, lead expert in the EVA project and is also represented. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Clara. Thank you, Malina, for inviting Sakri to uh, share the perspectives on the appliance energy efficiency. The information I'm going to share is based on the project we are implementing together with UNIDO, which is sponsored by the Swedish government. Uh, and it's being implemented in two regions, the Southern African Development Community, as well as the East African Community, uh, covering 21 member states. Um, uh, it's based on uh, four approaches to change, which include uh, improvement of uh, regulatory framework, where we are developing uh, minimum energy performance standards for various appliances that are prioritized by the member states. Then uh, private se sector support so to bring on board uh, private sector to implement energy efficiency projects. And uh, we are giving incentives for them to put up demonstration projects. And then capacity building both at uh, individual and institutional level. We are, we are supporting member states, especially uh, in testing. Uh, which is important as you implement the energy efficiency policies, you need to verify that the actual products that are being sold on the market do really comply to the standards that are set. 
And then the last one, but not the least, is on awareness raising. So from this, we have learned that the importance of energy efficiency policy relating to appliances um, at various levels uh, can include at households uh, to reduce household energy bills, which will make available, I think, uh, additional disposable income uh, for the family to, to, to use elsewhere. In terms of uh, grid reliability, uh, this will reduce on electricity shortages and blackouts. Uh, we have had the experiences, especially in the SADC region, where member states have faced deficit generation. And uh, in countries like South Africa and Zambia, currently, I think we have some form of load shedding on a daily basis. Uh, so if we embark on energy efficiency, I think it can mitigate uh, some of those uh, challenges that we are facing in regards of meeting demand uh, from the available supply. Uh, so at national level also, it will reduce the capital and loan side up in power stations and bridge upgrades and slows uh, demand for new growth. Uh, when you implement uh, the, the standards especially, uh, it goes to consumer protection where we we'll avoid being dumping grounds for technologies that have been uh, banned elsewhere. And then in terms of energy airports, it will reduce on the outflow uh, of uh, funds tied to fuel purchases, electricity imports, and also strengthen uh, national security. Uh, last but not the least is the uh, aspect of I think, protecting the environment. We are living in an era where there's climate change and uh, especially for those countries that are dependent on generation from fossil fuels, if we embark on energy efficiency uh, generally, then we'll reduce on the carbon footprint that uh, that country presents. Next slide. So in terms of the mechanisms available for um, transforming the market to energy efficiency, here I'm showing a graph uh, which is showing um, a plot of the volume of products sold against their efficiencies. We see that uh, the dotted line in the market that is unregulated, uh, uh, the volume of products sold uh, follows a normal distribution where uh, low numbers in terms of low efficiency products as well as low numbers in terms of higher efficiency products are sold. But uh, the moment we introduce minimum energy performance standards, uh, we cut off the shaded area in blue uh, of products that are inefficient on the market and see an immediate jump uh, in the efficient products that are being sold on the market because at this moment, manufacturers are just complying with the standards that have been set. Uh, the next blue line uh, indicates that if we introduce labels, which gives information uh, to end users uh, when they are buying products, when the performance of the products, we again pull the market to uh, sell more efficient products. If again, we introduce energy efficiency procurement guidelines, as well as other labels, uh, such as endorsement labels, which are shown here as energy star, then we further push the market uh, to sell more uh, higher efficiency products. And uh, in this case, I think uh, we also uh, benefit from the advantage that uh, while if we implement this successively, uh, then we can double uh, the rate at which energy efficiency uptake um, is being <coughs> effectively, I think, implemented both at country level as well as regional level if we have regional collaboration. Uh, thank you, I end here for now. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Makiliki, for this uh, overview. It was really, um, really uh, impressive for us to see all the good work that the Sub-Saharan Africa region is doing together with the UNIDO uh, within the ELA project. And I'm sure um, many of the participants also enjoyed this, uh, this overview. With this, uh, I hand over to Niha Dingra, a senior manager at CLASP in India, to share with us the India perspective. Thank you for joining us, Neha, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, can, yeah. 
All right. So uh, in the last presentations also, we've heard that appliances have a major impact on our climate. Now, we tried to quantify this a little bit further. And then our estimates revealed that appliances are responsible for approximately 40% of energy-related CO2 emissions. And this includes both direct as well as indirect emissions. And the appliance impact is also folded into other sectors such as industrial, commercial, and transport. So if you could, look, uh, if you look at this graph, then industrial sector, basically the appliances and equipment that are used in industrial sector contribute almost 50% to the overall energy-related GHG emissions from appliances. And if, uh, if we wanted to put it in perspective, then these emissions are equal to roughly the total CO2 emissions from China, Europe, and Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to reduce the impact of appliances on climate, uh, it has been proven that appliance energy efficiency is one of our most cost-effective tools. And recognizing that over 120 countries in the world have already adopted and developed SNL program, which could which are at different stages. So some countries have recognized the program of other countries, others have developed their own, and the programs are in different stages, such as nascent, mature, and advanced depending on the level of advancement and the level of production that the country has. In the COP28, so just to give a little bit of a, a global perspective, like why appliance energy efficiency is so important, in COP28 in December, countries signed up for doubling energy efficiency by 2030 in first ever global stock take report. And standards and labeling is one of the key contributors to doubling energy efficiency. Now, I, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of spotlight on India perspective. Um, so in India, 24% of contribution to a residential energy, uh, to energy consumption is from the residential sector. And if we look at the amount of savings that this SNL program has attributed to for India, it's around 60%. So out of all the energy efficiency savings that India has achieved, 60% of that has been contributed by the standards and labeling program if we look at the last five year period. And associated monetary saving, it's around 15.6 billion US dollars. So that's huge. So this is the kind of uh, monetary as well as emission saving that the program can add, can result in and hence it's, it's really important to me. Can we move on to the next slide please? Thank you. Um, so some of the key stakeholders for the program are, of course, policymakers, businesses, and consumers. If we were to just summarize everything that all of us have said, then uh, for policymakers, the key benefits include cost savings for the country. The program also helps in meeting national climate change goals. It helps addressing net, net zero targets that each country has, and it reduces peak electricity demands. And overall, it provides energy security to the country and the world at large. For consumers, it results in reduced electricity bills uh, because if we are using efficient appliances, then the electricity consumption gets reduced and then it provides access to affordable, efficient appliances. And for businesses, it provides competitive advantage. It provides uh, opportunity for technological innovation. It removes trade market barriers for trade if products were to be sold from one country to another, and it, and it also provides job creation opportunities. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Niha, for that um, overview, particularly for coming back to the big picture um, uh, aspects of this, which I want to talk about a bit more now. And thanks to everybody for their interventions as well. So um, as Niha mentioned, um, all governments um, got together uh, late last year and agreed to the concept of um, working together to double the rate of improvement of energy efficiency between uh, now and 2030. So, of course, appliance policy, as we've seen, is one of the one of the more successful policy measures that governments can endorse and can continually improve upon, even if they're already doing and already doing well. One of the things we see when we need to have near-term action, so 2030 is not far away, is one of the most practical things to do is do more of what you're already doing rather than try and, and bring, come up with new policies completely. So ratcheting up standards, um, introducing incentives for appliances, those sorts of things where you're based on basing this on, a, on existing policy infrastructure 
that's that's the one of the quickest ways and most effective ways of, of getting new savings. But but in the concept in the context of doubling, I don't know, is Neil still with us or has he had to drop out? I'm here. You're here. Yeah. No. So, Niels, could I just start with you and 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 just ask you, in in the concept of the the need to double the rate of improvement of energy efficiency, how do you see the Commission's appliance standards and lane or appliance energy efficiency policies contributing to that doubling? How important are they going to be as part of your approach? I th I think they're gonna. I mean, focus is very much now on delivery. I would say in the European Union, in the last five years, we had. Um, political mandate of, uh, let's say, at the federal uh, EU level where, where I work in the executive, focused a lot on putting in place a legislative framework uh, to enable us to um, uh, meet ambitious uh, energy and climate policy goals in 2030 and get us on the path towards net zero in 2050. And we now have this quite comprehensive um, uh, framework agreed just just uh, last week. The, the uh, one of the last pieces fell into place. A, a bill energy performance and buildings directive very important as well. And so I think there is a joint. Uh, there is a common sense now that now the focus needs to to turn to delivery and implementation. And on uh, specifically on appliance standards and programs, we have actually, as part of this uh, last mandate, also reviewed our legal basis for um, uh, that we used to uh, do maps on. So the eco design uh, directive was was revised, and and so now we have a very sound basis for for delivering, continuing to deliver, and we have very ambitious. Um, uh, program in the next two years to revise a lot of our existing maps and labels uh, so that they, they get up to speed with markets and technologies and they deliver even more. And I think it's funny, we, we saw the refrigeration here was one of the first um, products we had started with in, in the union. And just two years ago, as a little anecdote, I bought a, a, the best fridge I could, I, I renovated my kitchen. I bought the best fridge I could find on the market via our database uh, on, on labeled products. It was a B labeled, uh, it was a B labeled uh, fridge uh, and it was 116 kilowatt hours. So beating the average now. Now, uh, actually the A, A category is full of products now just two years on. So although we've been regulating fridges uh, for, for decades, uh, there is still improvements to come. And uh, we're gonna try to harvest uh, a lot of those savings, of course. And then as, as I said, we're also gonna focus increasingly on, on uh, harvesting uh, the savings in the production phase of products and, and making sure that appliances last longer because this is very, um, uh, popular to uh, to consumers that we make their appliances last longer and make them repairable because that saves a lot of, as well. Uh, at least for some types of appliances, you could say the low hanging fruits have perhaps uh, have uh, have perhaps been uh, been uh, captured in in Europe at least. And there, there's a lot uh, the, the relative uh, importance of the other cycles of uh, other phases of the life cycle of the product, of course, increase. But I'm I'm sure this is. Um, going to take, take up an increased, uh, let's say, importance in the EU because um, focus is so much on delivery and, and showing actual value for, for consumers. Thanks, Niels. That's, um, that's really enlightening. And um, I think the work that the Commission is doing on the longevity and the repairability of appliances is extremely important. And I, I hope it will be a, a, something that the rest of the world um, follows. So, um, Great, great, great de developments there. I mean, people do talk about the embodied energy, of course, in appliances and in, in most of the traditional appliances, they use so much more in use than in manufacture that it's not such a, an issue. But as you say, as we as we go towards the margins of the most efficient products we can find, it becomes more uh, significant. So um, really, really important to, to make those um, make those other services available to consumers. So maybe we can move on to um, Yuan Xia from um, from Sinis and ask about about China's ambitions for um, net zero by um, twenty sixty. If I'm not wrong, um, how do you think appliance policy can help make that happen by um, by doing things more quickly? Um, if you, if you wouldn't mind, if you're still with us, perhaps not. Um, maybe, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, you are. Okay, yeah. I've got you now. Thank you. Yeah, often. Um, uh, in China, we have uh, uh, developed efficiency standards, maybe uh, for 67 uh, products, maybe accounting for 80% uh, 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 of building energy consumption, and also maybe more than uh, six, uh, 70 percent of industry consumption. So uh, we think maybe uh, so during uh, uh, increased uh, appliance energy efficiency is also very important to reach the uh, uh, carbon picking and carbon neutrality uh, goals. So during the 14th five year plan period, this uh, means uh, 2021 to 2025, uh, there are still two years left. Uh, the uh, NDRC and the uh, will uh, speed up will speed up the uh, the value of the energy efficiency standards. Uh, as I has said, uh, we uh, we have uh, we have uh, published uh, ten standards, and also there is still uh, seventeen standards under development. Uh, and also we have planned to. Uh, develop uh, standards maybe for uh, electric vehicle charging stations, the servers, the storage devices, and uh, mm, uh, some new appliances to uh, deeply uh, in, uh, explore the energy saving potential. So, uh, and this year, the uh, NDRC has also published a document about uh, the top round level of 43 uh, products to guiding the uh, industry progress and to also to guide the standards review. So uh, maybe uh, that's the work we have been doing. Thank you. And um, of course, we all watch what China is doing in this space because it's going to impact on us all uh, because you're one of the major suppliers of product around the world. And I think that, that one of the things that's always been uh, you know, really um, amazing to, to, to the rest of the world is the, is, the, is the breadth of your program, the number of products that you cover and the fact that you have very much a routine of re revising um, and reviewing standards and you're looking at what's around, going on around the world. You know, 20 years ago, it was much more of a, an in-looking, inward-looking program. Um, but now, of course, you've, um, you, you're looking at, at a collaboration uh, with international standards processes uh, and making sure this is a really global process. So it's, it's great to see that. Um, maybe I could turn to India and to Niha. Yeah, in this, um, India put a lot of emphasis on the, the doubling of energy efficiency through its G20 presidency last year. How do you think the appliance programs can contribute to that aspiration? Um, I think the appliance program uh, will play a very critical role in meeting that target. Um, as I was uh, sharing the impact that is associated with the program, it's huge. And now, Bureau of Energy Efficiency is also putting in even more effort in kind of intensifying both the policy development as well as its implementation through kind of ensuring compliance at the state level. So that is one. And second is that, you know, we are uh, planning to work uh, to kind of develop a roadmap for appliance energy efficiency in particular to help India meet the doubling, the, the goal of doubling energy efficiency. So the roadmap will lay out some of the key appliances, the key sectors, and how and what needs to be done for each of those appliances if we were to keep on track of the path of doubling energy efficiency. And we're hoping to get that uh, some of that uh, you know um, analysis out by the end of the year. I think that would kind of pave the way and kind of show the light in terms of how uh, the, the targets need to be met. And first of all, even before they need to be met, first of all, defining the target for each of the appliances that we were to double. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Because again, uh, India is another market to watch. Um, what happens there influences influences everybody. I mean, I'm a firm believer that um, we wouldn't have um, high quality LED lighting in all of our homes in Europe had India not, not, not as quickly as we have, had India not chosen to really you know, take this problem on very, very early on and um, 
and and um, you know show, show the rest of the world how to do it. So so thank you. Um, that's that's really interesting. So of course you know everybody, every continent, every region has its own priorities. Um, but um, I'd like to turn to Africa and to Redley and and ask. I mean, we used to try and talk about energy efficiency in 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 the African region, and people used to say. Oh, don't bother. We haven't got enough, you know, efficiency, the rich, a rich man's, a rich country's problem. But um, we, of course, wanted to kind of persuade people that if energy was used efficiently from the start, then more people could have access to modern energy services. Um, how do you think that's playing out? Is that working? Is there more that we should be doing? And how does appliance policy contribute to that process? That's if you're still with this readily. Sorry, uh, my mic was on mute. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Yes, I, I'll start with uh, the SADAP uh, perspective. I think around 2007, 2008, uh, utilities predicted uh, the um, deficit in generation and uh, working through the Southern African powerful demand side management working group, they Tasks, I think, uh, member state utilities to implement um, energy efficiency programs which would mitigate uh, this deficit in generation so that they match the supply and demand. I think included the rollout uh, in some cases for free of uh, exchange of incandescent bulbs uh, with efficient uh, either LED or CFLs. I think that a number of countries in the SADC region implemented that program, uh, some are still implementing. There was also, I think, energy switching in terms of uh, uh, water heating, uh, switching from electric geysers as well as um, uh, going to solar water heaters. And uh, Zimbabwe is one of the countries that has also instituted the law where new uh, construction in terms of domestic housing uh, needs to move away from uh, electric geysers to solar water heaters, and then uh, others like power factor correction for the industry. And also uh, the static energy ministers uh, with this, uh, I think, challenge uh, made a decree that uh, all member states should phase out inefficient lighting, uh, targeting incandescent by 2019. But we saw that uh, only two or three countries, I think, instituted statutory instruments to do this plan. So the coming on board of the ELA projects, the energy efficient lighting and appliances project, brought a systematic approach, I think, for member states to uh, embrace the implementation of energy efficiency so that uh, the savings that could be made can go towards um, uh, connecting either new customers on board or just uh, being able to mitigate the deficit that the utilities were meeting in terms of uh, not matching the demand and the supply. So the ELA project, like I mentioned in my presentation, um, is looking at four aspects. One of them is improving the regulations. So far, we have developed minimum energy performance standards for lighting, uh, as well as uh, for cooling appliances, which involve refrigerators and uh, air conditioners. Uh, the approach is to harmonize these standards within the region so that we can uh, reduce the barriers to trade as well as reduce uh, in terms of expenditure and terms of compliance efforts if uh, the member states' national standard bodies are collaborating. Uh, uh, so far, five countries have adopted these uh, maps for lighting at national level. That includes the DRC, uh, Mozambique, Eswatini, Namibia and South Africa. And today, I think South Africa, uh, sorry, tomorrow, uh, there they, they will be a uh, conclusion of uh, a stakeholder uh, meeting with the industry association uh, because now these maps for lighting will be made mandatory. For maps for cooling appliances, which involve refrigerators and air conditioners, Zimbabwe has been one of the uh, early mover countries to adopt this at national level. Uh, and then six other uh, countries, so five other countries are being supported uh, to do stakeholder consultation so that uh, they are also adopted at national level, which include Namibia, Guinea, Botswana, uh, South Africa itself, 
uh, Zimbabwe, uh, as well as Seychelles. Uh, based on, on the program, I think uh, uh, as we implement these uh, policy packages, uh, focusing on regulation, uh, uh, information to the end users as well as man manufacturers as incentives. There's also an aspect of capacity building that is required, which is very important, especially in forms of testing uh, for the member states, because uh, when we are doing this project, we have noticed that there's lack of testing capacity within the two regions, E and uh, uh, ESC and SARE. So, uh, we have supported the member states, one, for the lighting, uh, by purchasing a portable lighting test equipment, which has been made available to each of the 21 member states uh, on the project. And then we have selected uh, three uh, countries uh, to further capacitate them with additional equipment, which will be stationary now at the National Standards Board the Laboratories. And these uh, will be centers of excellence and they'll be accessible by the other member states within the region. So that in case a member state um, is unable to test a particular product and they can reference that product to this uh, uh, test center of excellence within the region. So, and also by encouraging this uh, mutual collaboration, we'll be reducing uh, in terms of the compliance efforts that are required to uh, implement these energy efficiency policies that we developing under the project. So we have also seen member states, I think, embracing this by uh, producing dedicated instruments such as energy efficiency strategy and action plans uh, to uh, set targets so that by 2030, they, 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 they meet the energy efficiency targets that they are setting within these policies. Thank you, Red Lake. And that is a, it actually leads on to what I was going to ask everybody else very briefly next, but you've covered it very well. Um, the, the importance of, of international collaboration. I think um, the, the ELA project is, is one of the most outstanding examples uh, out there of, of how international collaboration can help countries, how it can help things happen more quickly, um, more cost effectively. You know, the whole idea of sharing resources and having uh, test labs, for example, that uh, have mutual recognition agreements across regions so they can be used by anybody. I mean, these are all things that we need to see happening in other regions. And it's great to see, to Af see Africa taking a lead in this in this collaborative effort. So I just want to go to a couple of other, our, our other um, speakers and, and very quickly, just in less than a minute. Niels, what do you see the benefits of international collaboration are um, for appliance policy? Um, I think it's very much linked to the, the let's say, the, the cost and the difficulty of standardization, but also, of course, of facilitating international trade. Even for a region like Europe, I can tell you, and even the richer member states in Europe find it difficult to have uh, the expertise required to have test labs for all the products we cover. And there they, they call upon the European Union, so the federal level, to have uh, test labs and so on, or, or they, they share it a bit among each other. So even amongst the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the advanced regions that have had this program for decades, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And so uh, if we can share this challenge better, that's, uh, that's great. And to give you an example, we are right now reviewing our sta standards for external power supplies and also for electronic displays. And we are very much looking at what the US is doing uh, in this field, uh, lending their uh, test results and so on, and, uh, and, and looking at their analysis. Um, and these are, of course, globally traded products. So if we can align, uh, it, it is, it's better for everybody, including for industry and consumers, because it, it takes the cost, cost of compliance down. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, they're exactly the sorts of benefits we, we hoped you'd mention. And maybe I could just um, have the last word, ask um, uh, GUIN to have the, Shia, sorry, to have the last word. In terms of this international collaborative approach, you know, how do you think, um, how do you think China is benefiting from that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, can I repeat your question? So how is China benefiting from international collaboration on energy, on appliance energy efficiency policy? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the first thing I think maybe for the uh, for a bigger producer of appliance in the world, I think uh, 
maybe uh, if we uh, if there is a uh, national or regional uh, hybridization, I uh, think uh, it can prevent uh, inefficient products phased out uh, by one country from flowing into other country. So maybe we can uh, achieve, uh, uh, yeah, we can achieve more aggressive uh, carbon goals together. And also maybe for, for, for us, uh, it can reduce the cost of testing and the certification, reduces the resources waste. Yeah. I think that's, that's the, the great answers. Thank you, um, Yu Yuan. Um, and they're, they're exactly what this, this conversation is about and what this course is about. So the we've produced this appliance energy efficiency course so that people can share experience from around the world. We don't have to start from scratch. We will, um, of course, update it as experience develops. Um, and we hope that everybody can use it to, um, maybe it's, it's in a place where the policies are already advanced, but there are new staff, or it's a place where policies in this area are new. Everybody needs to learn more from it. So hopefully this is a, a multi-purpose course that will help um, speed up the um, application of effective appliance energy efficiency policies. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers. I'd like to thank the team at the IEA for producing the course and for producing the webinar. And um, I hope people who do undertake the course find it useful and enjoyable, but please do give us feedback. Let us know how you think it could be improved and we uh, will continually update it. Thank you very much indeed and have a great day. Thank you.